Hi y'all, in this video I'm going to carry on the discussion about transgenders in the military, but before I get to it, uh, I made a video previously on this and covered a lot of material, I'll link that below. Uh, the video that was a response to, the author of the uh, video that is a response to, has made a follow-up video where she has changed her mind and now uh, largely agrees with me, so uh, I'll put a link to that uh, below too, and you guys can check it all out if you're new to the conversation or if you just want to follow up with what happened after my video. Uh, but I want to discuss some things that weren't particular to Theron's video that are important. Um, one of the dueling narratives that makes the difficult discussion is that uh, there are two major examples of transgender veterans that are going to be pointed to, and depending on which side of the argument you're on, you're going to find someone who's on your side of the argument who's going to point to one of them and say, aha, that one proves that I'm right, and then the other side's going to go, ah, not so fast, look at this one, this one proves my point. And the problem is you're looking at extreme outliers and it doesn't really say much about what, what the trend in the transgender population looks like. Uh, so the, the two in question, have, uh, I saw on Twitter and other places, some uh, people on the right will say, Chelsea Manning is all the proof that you require that transgenders don't belong in the military because all the things that Chelsea Manning did. And the other side will go, aha, but we have a former Navy SEAL, Kristen Beck. So clearly they can do quite well and they can uh, meet the toughest standards in, in, in spec ops and have a wonderful career, rah, 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 three bags full. So the difficulty here is that the, uh, the military is a risk, has a risk mitigation component to it where uh, there are just certain risks you cannot get away from. I mean, the business is war, so you're going to lose people. It's unavoidable. You just have to accept it. You have to take uh, those facts, those brute facts about reality, uh, right in the teeth. But there are other things, risks, that you don't have to take at all. And whenever you are entertaining doing some new thing, um, you have to think about what are the risks uh, that are here and what are the assets, what are the benefits that I might get in the long run. And the difficulty with the military, because of the type of organization it is, where when you get something wrong, it redounds uh, to the death of your troops, you have to be very careful about the risk side. Um, so if you get one Chelsea Manning, you could have a thousand Kristen Becks and the equities are not going to balance out because the military is a type of organization where one bad actor is capable of undoing the work of tens of thousands of people. Um, that's why espionage is such a power element of war because if you know that your enemy's order of battle, it doesn't matter how good those troops are, if you know precisely what they're going to do, when they're going to do it, and where they're going to do it, you are able to uh, respond to that before it happens, so you're very well prepared for it. That's why people think Montgomery was a genius of a general. He wasn't. We had just broken the codes. I mean, if you're going to be a general who has access to your enemy's entire order of, order of battle, and you're losing, you are going to have a lot of apologizing to do for your incompetence. So anyway, um, the dueling narrative there is Kristen Beck did great work. I completely agree. Uh, Navy SEAL, SEAL Team 6, badass, did great work, although I'm going to say some things that aren't terribly polite about her in a moment. Uh, but you've also got Chelsea Manning. And when you say, we're going to change the policy and let these people in, it's not, it, it is not in and of itself going to debar their entrance into the service, you will get some good people, but you will also get some bad people. It's just the nature of expanding this, the uh, the uh, population from which you, you're drawing. When you expand the pool of candidates, you'll get some good ones and some bad ones, and you can't filter out all the bad ones. So you really have to think about that. That's why we do this on categories. It's You look at the trends in the general population you're interested in studying and saying, well, it, it won't apply to everybody. It's not true about everybody in the population, but look at the pr proportion here of this thing that we don't like. Uh, yes, we could get a few good troops out of that. It would be great, but we'd also get one or two or three bad ones who, if they get in a bad position, could royally screw us, and that outcome is not worth the risk. We'll just not do that. And then the response to that is, well, you let uh, white people in. Yes, white males. We can't get away from that. That's the bulk of the population. That's where we're always going to have to turn when we need more soldiers. So we're just stuck with that. Whatever the risks are of heterosexual white males in the United States, we just have to take that in the teeth. That is our baseline. Something is either approximately the same as it, better than it or worse than it. And if it's worse than it uh, by a substantial degree, you're on the losing end of that stick. Sorry, it's a, you know, it's a, it's two bowls of shit. Take a sniff and start licking. Choose which flavor you don't like. So, 
you will get people when they when uh, Kristen Beck is when you talk about trans, the transgender issue, and they'll say, "Why are you saying bad things about Kristen Beck?" Even though the person hasn't mentioned Kristen Beck, but I'm going to say some bad things about Kristen Beck to point out um, just how long and well the termites have dined. Before I do that, though, some people are going to point out that uh, I was not a Navy SEAL. I couldn't get through. Uh, I wasn't fit for it. You're right. It is absolutely true that I was not able to uh, to do SEAL training. And the reason for that is that the Navy has anti-Army bias. And I tried to convince them I'm a trans mariner and that they need to make an accommodation for me, even though they don't think that uh, soldiers are good quality material for their Navy SEAL program. I tried to persuade them that I'm a trans mariner. And then they misgendered me by calling me a trans squid. So... Suck on that, Navy. I even knew, uh, you know, what Marlin Spike seamanship is and everything. And they're like, sorry, green boy. Shoot. Clearly bias. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a large advocacy group to go around and complain on my behalf, so I just had to take that in the teeth and say, apparently, I'm not good enough to be a Navy SEAL because, you know, they don't like me. <clears throat> and then and then my, my allies had to get on Twitter. Lady Gaga sent out a tweet on my behalf, which was very kind, and said, do you know what the suicide rate is among soldiers who don't get to be trans mariners? It's already very high. It's extremely high. It's one of the highest in the world. Don't you want people with extremely high suicide rates? I mean, just think what that will do in, in combat. You won't even need an enemy anymore. Why, your force can just kill itself. And it's so much more friendly that way when you don't have to burden your enemies with the, with the hardship of actually fighting you in order to win. So Kristen Beck was on CBS, and uh, there was some Congress creature on um, Fox News talking to Tucker Carlson about Kristen Beck and how you can't say these bad things about Kristen Beck, even though Kristen Beck had not been mentioned. Uh, well, Kristen Beck was on CBS doing an interview, and here is what uh, she said in respect of the, the argument about the cost uh, that would attend uh, seeing to the medical needs, the transition needs, surgery, all the other things, in relation to transgender folks in the military. And he said, you know, you could buy uh, a wheel for the joint uh, strike fighter for the F-35 and uh, that would buy that would pay for their surgeries. In other words, you could you could just take a, a wheel for an F-35 and use that as a currency to cover my, his particular her particular, his whatever pet issue. The fact that a former Navy SEAL when given uh, the option to discuss the cost of this to the to the military would actually let it resonate anywhere inside his or her mind that, you know, just take a wheel from one of our, our uh, combat fighter jets and, you know, that would, that would cover it, should tell you all you need to know about what the priorities here are. It is not about military preparedness. It's not about military readiness. It's not about uh, lethality. It's not about combat effectiveness. It's about meeting this person's particular political ideology, the consequences of which just be damned. So uh, I've been asked about some of the statistics I've used, and so I'm going to go through some of those um, now, and I will put links to the studies below so you can check behind me. When I say that the prevalence of, of suicide issues in the trans community are high, I don't mean like, you know, a little bit high. I mean, two-thirds of them have suicide ideation. 41-ish to 50 percent, you know, I've seen it's run the gamut from, uh, you know, 30 to like 50 percent, so split the difference, call it 40 percent of them, attempt suicide. Uh, that is not good. There is no other condition that even has anything substantially similar to that which we allow in the military. It is a categorical debarment. The uh, suicide attempt rate for schizophrenics is 60%. The suicide attempt rate for bipolar disorder is about 50%. So, you know, that's, that's higher than transgenderism. But transgenderism is higher than many other uh, psychological conditions which are automatic, uh, non-waverable debarments to service. But for some particular reason, because it's politically fashionable and you have entryism, thanks to whoever gave me that word, by the way, uh, the you know, entryism, I want to get into that. Look, what I, those people are doing something, I want to be a part of it. Uh, if you have any condition that comes with that sort of risk, we just don't take you. So, um, this is from... Suicide Among Veterans and Other Americans. So this is a comparison between the baseline suicide rates of veterans and uh, the general population. And it is uh, this. The uh, overall risk for suicide uh, was 21% 20, higher among veterans when compared against uh, the general population. 
So it's a 21% uh, 21 increase for those who have served in the military. And that breaks down to an 18% increase for males uh, as compared against uh, males in the civilian population. And then uh, the risk for suicide for females was 2.4 times higher for them than against uh, females in the civilian population. By the way, whoever wrote this should take some technical writing classes. You don't want to switch to times uh, from between percentages and times because people have, then have to start doing the math to figure out what the, the problem is there. So 2.4 times is 140% larger than the baseline of females in, in the general population. So uh, that's the baseline with which we are confronted. For males, uh, whatever the conditions are that uh, are true in the general population creates their rate. Then they go into military service, they do that, they get out and they're veterans, and until they have their suicide event of whatever type it happens to be, those are the conditions you have to deal with. That person's passed up to that point. The uh, effects of that, whatever they are, only increase the suicide rate, even during wartime, by about 18% for heterosexual males. Well, males in general. It uh, doesn't parcel out by gay or straight. Sorry about that. So their resilience is the best of all the categories that have been studied. Uh, women, 140% uh, increase in their suicide rate from having served in the military and going into the VA. Now, uh, I have to go to a different uh, study, which is um, about the prevalence of suicide issues in the uh, gender identity dis disorder category in the VA. Now, this is using the 2013 gender identity disorder uh, definition, which was changed by the APA to become gender dysphoria, and they did a little bit of um, political redefining to make it harder to really know what they're talking about. But using the criteria that they used then, uh, here, here's what they, they find. Um, it's called prevalence of gender, uh, sorry, gender identity dis disorder and suicide risk among, among transgender veterans uh, in the VA system. So the objective is to estimate the prevalence and incidence of gender, uh, gender identity disorder uh, diagnoses among veterans in the system and then uh, examine their suicide risk. So the method is they examine the electronic medical records from 2000 to 2011 for the diagnostic codes that indicate this condition. Uh, and they generated annual periodic prevalence estimates and calculated the incidence there uh, using the earliest data point they had, which was 2000, as their baseline. And then they cross-referenced it with uh, available data from 2009 to 2011 of suicide-related events among uh, users to examine suicide risk. So GID prevalence in the VA is higher than uh, previous estimates in the general population. 22.9 per 100,000 persons in the VA versus 4.3 in, in the general population. Now this is actually interesting. It's about five times higher in the veteran population than in the uh, civilian population. So apparently transgender folks are drawn to the military, which is interesting. Uh, conclusion, though, the prevalence of GID diagnosis nearly doubled over the, the, that 10-year period. Uh, the research on these people who have been diagnosed transgender and transsexual uh, populations is sparse throughout the country, um, but they have a uh, lifetime suicidal ideation of 61% uh, as one study. Um, <clears throat> anyway, you get the point. So the suicide ideation is thinking about killing yourself, you know, like seriously contemplating it. T about two-thirds of them seriously contemplate it. About 40% actually attempt it and some lesser number... Uh, managed to pull it off. So, the transgender uh, population in the VA ha uh, has a suicide uh, event, a suicide related event rate that's 20 times what it is for um, males. And it's so what, uh, 20 times is 1,900% higher than what it is for male veterans. And against uh, the general population in the VA, uh, uh, it is 2,300 uh, some odd percent higher. So that's about 24 times uh, as risky as it is for uh, heterosexual males. That is not trivial. That is very serious. Now, when people... Uh, think about this, they say, well, why don't you just screen for that? You cannot effectively screen against it. And the reason for it is quite simple. If you ask a person, do you have suicidal ideation? A lie, no, looks exactly like the truth, no. There is no way for a psychologist to 
you know, agree or disagree. They just have to take it at face value. Unless they strip the person and find, like, uh, you know, hesitation marks or something. So if there's something that turns up on a physical exam, then that would help. But just on the psychological front, if the person lies, uh, psychologists are completely helpless to pick that up. They cannot uh, screen for that at all. So you have to be a very bad liar um, to get caught by a psychologist. Or if you walk in, you have to be extraordinarily obviously wacky, for them to, where you know every person and their blind dog will notice that this person's not quite right in the head. Um, other than that, it, you're pretty helpful. We're finding something on an actual physical examination. Now, I've gotten some pushback because people are like, well, if this is true, then what does it say about women in the military or gays in the military? Uh, on the gay front, um, it's really, I have not found really good statistics on uh, parceling it out by lesbian, by gay, by bisexual, and by transgender. And one of the problems for it is that people treat, uh, tend to treat LGBT, GLBT as a monolith. And the problem there is that you have T that's been stuck on the end. And ever since it's been stuck on the end, their particular problems uh, kind of bleed over and are attributed also to the LGBT, I'm sorry, the LGB part of LGBT. And uh, they've also tried to, many of them have tried to hijack and make it all about them, but that's a separate issue. Uh, so it makes it really hard to say, but um, I put a link to the study too, found that the, the incidence of suicide rates for homosexual males, or males who engage in same-sex behavior, is pretty much restricted to the adolescent years, and they did a study of following people from age 12 to age 28. If that's true, uh, that uh, there is some period where it's high and then some later period where it's low, if the low period is about the same as the heterosexual males uh, who are you know, of uh, age to enter 17, 18, 18, 17 parental permission, then I am perfectly fine imposing a ban that says, I'm sorry gay folks, you can't join until 26, 27, 20, whatever the year is where that tapers off to approach normal, if it does at all. And if not, then you have to look at the, uh, the prevalence. If it is higher than the uh, suicide rate of the heterosexual males, how much higher is it? If it's only a little bit higher, you don't need to do a lot of work to say, well, you can get away with that. But when there's a substantial likelihood, a, su a, su a substantially higher likelihood, you have to do more work to justify the change. So. Um, uh, women in combat, I've been, I have said that if a woman can meet the standards, the same standards as the least competent male, she should be permitted to try out. Why is there no contradiction there between saying this, uh, get rid of the, the transgendered folks, but women can stay when we know that most of them won't be able to meet the standards? The reason is quite simple. There's no opportunity cost, or a very trivial opportunity cost, that goes into testing them, to screening them, to see if they can go uh, try the training. It literally, the people go around anyway to various units and they do their recruiting and the people who are interested take a test, you know, and so the cost there is the little bit of ink that you have to use to write down, you know, how fast they ran, whatever, you know, whatever else it is, and the sheets of paper. It's not a hundred some odd thousand dollars, you know, of surgery, it's cents, it's literally pennies, you know, whatever, however much ink it takes to fill out that form, that's, that's the cost right there. So the cost is, it is quite trivial. Um, you don't have to go cannibalizing our fighter aircraft, which by the way, why don't we just sell off a couple of aircraft carriers and we can pay, a lot, like, pay for lots of stuff that way. All you have to do is like check under the couch and you can cover that. And I have said that there should be a general ban on that. I'm comfortable with the general ban on women in combat arms uh, that is waverable if a woman shows, uh, presents clear and convincing evidence that she is likely to, to be able to hack it there. And whatever else would need to go into that over and above the ink that would be required to fill out the paperwork, uh, pay for it yourself. Uh, it, I don't think it's going to cost much, but if it does, pay for it out of your own pocket. And then you come in and you show your commander. Hey, commander, look what I've done. I've done all this. Uh, here are the things they tell the boys to practice on before they go. I do them all. I've met this standard they say that is what you need to be meeting in order to do it, to have a, a good likelihood of, of passing this training. What do you think, sir? What do you think, ma'am? And the commander's going to look at it and go, yes, you've done that, or no, you haven't. And the difference here is also, and this is crucial, the distinctions that are being tested here uh, are physical. Uh, there are facts uh, of the physical variety, the physiological variety, so those are two, si two sets of facts, uh, facts that just exist in the world and facts that are particular to a person, and then there are mental facts. Psychologists deal with mental facts, and they're all but helpless to figure out when they're being deceived especially if they don't meet the same patient 
uh, week after week after week, session after se session after session, for sometimes years to figure out what's going on. Uh, whereas physiological issues are instantly recognizable. You get on the treadmill and run. You either can do it or you cannot do it. Pull yourself up uh, over this, this bar for X many times. You either make it or you don't. There's not guesswork. Um, and then there are physical facts, uh, which this addresses the issue about what about uh, people who bring up, um, you know, blacks have a higher rate of criminal activity, uh, criminal convictions, so I guess we can ban black people because they're likely to commit crime. The re there's a reason that we don't take their word for it when they say, no, Mr. Uh, recruiter Man, I'm a really good guy. We, back we do a background investigation on everyone. We take no one's word for it, unlike the psychologists who have to take people's word for it. If the person says, no, I don't have suicidal ideation, the psychologist says, you do not have suicidal ideation. Check. Actually, what they write is, patient denies uh, suicidal ideation. <clears throat> um, so they're really, a tr they're, not e they're not even giving an opinion. They're not even really agreeing with you. They're just restating what it is that you've said. And the third, yes, the person says they did not do this. The person says they did not have that. The person says they did not have the other. Uh, based on these facts, if they were true, I say the person's good to go. I have no reason uh, to think they're not true. The person's good to go. Uh, and another point on that is we don't do, we don't do a psychological evaluation of any type. It's one question on on the medical form for normal males and normal females. And the reason for it is that baseline rate that you just can't get away from is what you're stuck with. So it wouldn't matter what the baseline rate is for uh, straight white males. We are just stuck with it because that's the population from which we draw. Women's suicide rates are lower than men's. And white men's, curiously enough, are lower than black men's. But you don't, you're, not going to tur you're not going to build an effective military by turning to your smallest subsets of the population and trying to recruit from there. You need the best from the largest pool that you can get, so you have lots and lots of options. Anyway, uh, so we don't need to do it. And because they are the baseline, and history shows that uh, men are really good at war, uh, you get this effect where the increased rate of inc uh, the increased incidence of suicide-related events is only 18%. Now, mind you, I say only 18% because that doesn't, it's not a great deal. It means about 20%. Uh, but you hear about it in the news all the time. Oh, this high suicide rate among veterans. And, you know, it's an, it, I agree, it's an issue. But we need to keep in mind that they're talking about how this needs to be addressed. This is a serious concern. But then when you get a population that has a suicide rate that is, you know, uh, orders of magnitude larger, suddenly this, this is a bare triviality. It's banal. It's improper to even, like, consider that. No, don't, don't worry about that 2,300 increased risk of suicide. A percent, uh, you know, don't worry about that. It's, it doesn't mean anything. You can't draw any inferences from that. A college professor was on Theron's video and said this. And uh, apparently the person's not very good at math because uh, they seem to think if, we don't have, if, I don't have direct, if someone doesn't have direct stats about what happens in the military, you can't draw inferences about what happens to the military based on the other information we have. That's not true, uh, because you know a start point, there's a certain baseline uh, rate, and you know an end point with a certain baseline rate. Whatever changes happen, uh, are, uh, they happen between those two points, and whatever is the cause of those changes happen in that time frame. And the, the events that the people share in common are military service. And then whatever else happens up until a suicide event relate is recorded, a suicide-related event is recorded in that person's file. So it's not perfectly pristine, but it isn't like that you have this baseline rate where transgender people are 800% likelier in the general, than non-military ones, just civilian ones, are 800% likelier uh, to be involved in a suicide-related incident than in the general population. And then that stays the same all throughout military service, and there's no increase, and then suddenly one day, just bam. It, no, it's, it's a, the population trend is, is a continuous function. There's an intermediate value between these two points, and it must pass through there and you can put bounds on it. So you can say it's between here and here, and whatever, uh, whatever is the cause, the explanation for that difference, whatever it is, is related to the events that happened in this time frame. <clears throat> anyway, so uh, we don't need to do it for the men because they're already sufficiently resilient. There's nothing extra that needs to happen in relation to that. So there's no contradiction. I don't have an inconsistent position about gays in the military or transgender people. If it is true, that the suicide rate among the gay population is uh, substantially higher than in the straight population, uh, then 
that is an argument to be had about why they should be excluded. And if there is a period of time where it tapers off and approaches what is the baseline or within an acceptable range of the baseline, then that, that objection would evaporate. And then you could say, okay, gay people are banned until the age of 25 or 28, 30, whatever it happens to be. Uh, I'm not ideological on this. I really do mean it when I say my goal for the military is what it brings to bear in war. And everything else is bullshit. All the rest of it is rhetoric. The statistics don't matter because statistics change very few, very few people's minds. As, like, you know, these people on the left, the progressives, think it's a good argument when they say things like, Mr. President, this group of people is so fragile. And the way you know that what you're doing is wrong is look at their rate of killing themselves. It is so high. And therefore, it's impolite and potentially dangerous for you not to give them what they want. Well, you know, that might, some, some transgender people might well kill themselves over this, of being told no. I don't know if that's true or false. It could happen. Uh, that doesn't change the calculus, though. It's not about what redounds to the personal edification of the individual. It's, it's mission first, period. Not mission first, comma, and no, mission first, full stop. Anything that does not serve to maintain or enhance the lethality of our military so it remains absolutely dominant in all respects in, in a combat environment is bullshit with which uh, one can easily dispense. Unless the Constitution prohibits it. Like, for example, the, the real objection to saying, why can't you get rid of the black people is, uh, the Constitution says you can't do it, so that's why. Uh, now, if the people on the left want to argue we should change the Constitution to take out those post-Civil War amendments, I guess I'll let them argue that position because I'm certainly not going to be the one uh, who's going to advocate for that because I think it would be immoral. Uh, but one thing I know about the left is they don't have a great deal of morals. Now, uh, I would also like to mention this notion about um, if you ban it, you'll get a don't ask, don't tell kind of situation. True. But think about what that implies. Um, <clears throat> uh, sorry, don't think about what that implies. Think, think about this instead. Uh, what is it that a person who comes out of the closet frequently hears, uh, frequently says? What, do you, what is the most common phrase you hear from people when they talk about what it was like when they came out of the closet? They finally got to stop lying to people. I don't think pointing to the fact that they're just going to become liars is really uh, an argument in favor of saying, oh, well, my God, if they're going to lie if we don't let them in, we might as well let them in. I mean, how could, how could we possibly pass up a chance to have people who are willing to lie so easily? But what they say is uh, not that, that they chose to lie. No, no, they were forced to lie. Unless there is an actual threat to your safety, an actual threat to your life, you are not being forced to lie. There is something that you want. You can't get it by being honest. And therefore, the very obvious option, because you want it so badly, is to just lie. It's a perfectly normal human activity. People do it all the time. I don't condone it. Sorry. Anyway. Oh, and on the safe, safety point, Kristen Beck actually even said in that interview about how they start talking about safe zones in the military. The, the termites are dining uh, long and well, is all I have to say about that. Anyway, anyway so uh, the rest of it's rhetoric. Uh, you need to pay attention to when people are trying to uh, convey information to you versus convince you. Um, and there's a difference. You, a lot of people try to convince you by persuading you, appealing to your emotions using logically dubious uh, rhetorical devices that are effective. That's why they do it, because it works. Whereas, you know, numbers, statistics, I don't like math, go away, shoot. That's the kind of attitude that you get. So I try to do, uh, con I, I try to do uh, conveying uh, very often. And when I'm trying to do convincing, I do it by way of conveying. I give the information, I give the data as I know it to be. And when new data comes along, I change my mind. I, not wedded to these positions. If this, is what, if this is what the data show, it's what the data show you are just stuck with it, uh, whether you like it or not. So, what's my uh, solution to it all? One, ban them. Two, deal with the ones who were in the service now. Uh, the Obama administration, the United States government, doesn't matter whether the presidential administration changes, still the same government. It made a certain series of assertions to service members, which some service members believed uh, to be honest and in good faith, and they relied upon those assertions. And if, the, if Trump wants to get rid of them, that means they will have relied on that assertion to their own detriment. It's called detrimental reliance in the law. And you can uh, e-stop the government. Uh, you can e-stop a person 
who has given you a, a promise or a contract uh, which you have relied on to your own detriment by forcing that person to live up to their actual their actual promise. So if you uh, acted on it in good faith and it's now redounding uh, to your detriment because of some change in the conditions brought on by the person who offered the promise or offered the contract, the person who offered the promise or the contract just has to take it in the teeth. So that's the response to what do you do about the ones who are still there. I imagine there's going to be litigation if he actually tries to get rid of them. And I'm perfectly fine with that, by the way. They made it in under the wire. Uh, whether they should have been screened out or not screened out is neither here nor there. Once you get in your hours and we're stuck with you, so the And these people were told, you can now serve openly. Nothing's going to happen to you. They served openly. That information should not be able to be used uh, you know, to hurt them. You don't get to bait and switch people. We would not accept it if a district attorney walked in somewhere and said, I'm going to offer you a, a plea bargain, you know, and then, uh, and then walk, into, you know, walk into the grand jury and indict you. We're not going to let that prosecution go. The government made a promise. You do this, that, or the other. I'm going to give you this deal. The government must live up to its word, plain and simple. So having said all that, I think I actually have a solution that will definitively resolve these issues. Uh, so, hear me out. I am told constantly that whether people are on the far left or the far right or somewhere in between, that we're all patriots, we love this country, we want what's best for this country, we honor our founding fathers and the founding principles and all this other stuff. I don't believe that that is true, uh, but I'm told that, so I'll uh, just work on that assumption. It seems to me that um, what is quintessentially American is what happened in the Revolutionary War. Now, there was a group who was told, oh, you little colonists will never be able to pull it off, know your place. And then there were others who believed that, uh, actually, you know, we think we can pull this off. And we're so convinced that we're right, or at least that it's worth fighting for, uh, that we are willing to throw the dice, take a chance, and potentially condemn our posterity to the folly of our decisions, to the bad consequences of our being wrong. But if we're right, it will work a very positive benefit for our posterity. And we are now living, well, every generation since then has lived, uh, in, in a world which is a consequence of those actions, of our, of our founding fathers, of, of the founding generation, those brave men. And we're talking about the military. And the military is designed to fight wars. And what happens in the military when you're not in a war should have some relationship to being able to fight and win wars. And it seems to me that war games would be an ideal way to resolve this. After all, one side is definitively correct, and one side is definitively wrong. And because it's the military, we can't really sit around and, and just play the rhetoric games and you know emotional exploits here or uh, you know, dodgy statistics there, whatever it is. We can't afford to be wrong because it's the military, and we're not simply going to be wrong. We're going to be dead wrong. Now, if you're a conservative, I know you don't want to spend money on something like this, but hear me out anyway. Um, and if you're in the far left, you're probably not going to like it either, because why should we have to do this to, for our rights? As though there's some right to be in the military, they seem to think that there is. Uh, you should just give it to us. You know, that kind of thing. Um, a lot of money is going to be spent on this, no matter what happens. Uh, there's going to be litigation. It's going to go on for years. And so I put it to you for the people who are uh, on the conservative side, the, the right side of the aisle. If you're going to spend enormous sums of money to resolve this issue, it seems to me, and it seems to me that you can't avoid this money being spent to resolve these issues, that you might as well just go ahead and put up the full cost to definitively resolve these issues, so that way we don't have to let this one be another one of those perennial issues where, you know, oh, we do the ban now, and then the other party gets into the office and they undo the ban, and then, you know, it flips back and we reinstate the ban and more litigation happens. So what we should do is, is have a war game, so you get, uh, but it needs to be fair. I'm really big on that. So get all the transgenders in the military, uh, and they will be one coalition. Uh, and let's just go ahead and go the whole hog and do it all. So you'll have a coalition that's just the transgender. You'll have a coalition that's just females. They get to pick whichever ones they want, and it'll be of an equivalent size, size to all the transgenders that, that we have. And then the gay males, and then the straight males. And perhaps the women want to do straight women one and lesbian women one or maybe they want to integrate it, whatever, I don't care. They can sort that out for themselves. You get the idea. So we'll have a couple different groups who are going to be war gaming against each other and you'll go to NTC and do like gunnery and all this other stuff and they'll be graded and see who does better. Uh, make sure everybody's qualified and all this other stuff and, and uh, the transgenders will have an opportunity 
this will be on taxpayer pay, payer dollars, conservative people. I know you don't like it, but hear me out. Give them everything they want. This small group, uh, they you want new boobs? Here are your new boobs. You want put in a muffler? Here's your muffler. You want a little uh, you know horn that like you have on a bicycle that when you do this it goes squeak? Fine. Stick that in there too. Whatever you want, we'll give you everything that you want. So that way you are perfectly happy uh, that you are in the pristine emotional state to undertake the stress of this very large, uh, very intense and long uh, work I'm talking about. It could go on for a couple of years. I'm very serious about this. We really need to get this resolved. So uh, they will have all the time to do the surgery. I don't know, maybe six months, eight months, whatever the progression there is for all of them. And then they'll get uh, 18 months for them to you know, get all the hormone balances right. And for the women who have transitioned, who've had their sex change operation to you know, bulk up and get their muscles so that way they're at their physical peak. And you know everybody gets to do their own thing, so we, everybody's perfectly happy that they have this, the strongest team they can get, and uh, then it starts. And it needs to be intense. It needs to really replicate uh, the rigors of war. So you may have food shortages that will be regularly imposed on units. Uh, you're not taking leave regularly. You're going to be exhausted. You get your two days R and R every six months. You know, I mean, really, really, really rigorous, very intense. Uh, and uh, it needs to be done very seriously and it needs to be graded very fairly. So each grading team that monitors whatever stations and all the different places needs to have uh, someone from, uh, needs to have a conservative, uh, maybe a, a, a moderate of some type, needs to have a, a progressive, maybe a feminist progressive, whatever. So that way uh, no one can say afterwards that someone's finger's been on the scale. Because once this is over, it's a winner take all. Uh, the transgenders, if they uh, manage, for example, if it just happens to be the case that they are logistic geniuses, then so be it. Then we're just stuck with it, and if they're really that good where no one can beat them, then we should spend the money to make sure that we can get the good ones while uh, screening out the bad ones uh, as best you can. Something like that. Uh, the, what I predict is going to happen, though, and one of the reasons it won't, the war game won't happen is because one side's not going to want uh, to be for my predictions to be proved true, and they're not going to be willing to throw in the fate of uh, you know, their future decisions and other transgenders who will come after them uh, to the vicissitudes of their failure. That's just a hunch of mine as to what is going to happen in reality. But uh, what would happen if um, this game uh, does occur is that uh, transgenders will do uh, the least well. They will crack first. And the goal of this war game is to see which is to break the units, to see who has the resolve, who has the emotional resources, the psychological resolve, the will, the desire, and the resilience to really stick it out until there is uh, no one else left standing before them. There's an absolute, unquestioned, dominant one victor. Uh, transgenders will do the worst. Women will come next. Gay men and straight men, it's actually an open question uh, for me on the physical, uh, physical component. Though I have a hunch that the heterosexual males will uh, do better on the uh, emotional and psychological resilience than the gay males will. That's my prediction. I could be wrong. Everyone has something to lose here. Everyone has something to gain. If the transgenders just show that they actually can hack it and that the statistics that are in the veteran population don't model them, then we're just stuck with that decision. They have proved, the same way our founding fathers proved, that you question our competence, you question our abilities at your own cost. And if they can prove they can do that, then they get a say in uh, setting out some conditions by which uh, some transgenders will be able to serve uh, you know, on some conditions. So too with the women. If they can't hack it in the combat thing, then we're not going to be perpetually wondering about the future. You know, should we have women in combat arms? Should we not have women in combat arms? Let's put them in, com let's put them in war, or a war zone, I'm sorry, a war game, and see what they actually do. These are answerable questions. They are empirically available to us. All it costs is, is money and the will to resolve these important issues. And it's going to simplify our politics in, in one way. Because once it's over, it's over. And we don't need to hash that out anymore. And anytime some other group in the future wants to come up and say, Oh, that you lost. You lost. Which is exactly what would have happened to the Founding Fathers if we had lost uh, to Britain. They would have said, you lost, uh, you don't get the say that you think that you are entitled to, you couldn't hack it. Whereas, because we won, we get to say to them, uh, we get to say what we want, and we get what we want, because we won. 
So if the straight men are the are the you know the top dogs, then they are going to be the population uh, that's going to be catered to, and it's going to be their interests primarily uh, that are going to be seen to to make sure that because these are the people we need since they're the best and they're the population from which you know we're going to have to draw to make sure that we maintain the deadliest, most absolutely dominant force, military force known to the history of the world, and that anyone who dares to stand before us will be swept aside. Uh, swept aside, and any coalition of countries that want to challenge us in war will be swept aside to make it absolutely clear that we are going to focus on one thing only in our military, making sure that the people who serve in it are the absolute deadliest motherfuckers on the planet, and anybody stupid enough to take them on just dies. That is the whole point of a military, and as I said earlier, everything else is bullshit. So if the straight guys are going to be in the pecking order where I think they are, they're going to get uh, a substantial say in saying, no, we don't want this group serving with us. We think they are going to weaken us, and we don't want it, and they will be entitled to say that. Similarly, if the transgenders just, you know, perform spectacularly well, and everybody's like, oh my god, wow, then one, we'd be foolish to not uh, spend the money to get them, but two, they'll have earned a right to say that you must let some of us in on uh, some fair conditions. And if uh, you know, the women happen to like just be artillery whizzes, then they will have earned the right for all women to say, you know what, you can't deny us access to combat arms uh, because we have proved that women can do it at least as well as the boys. And so we don't need to wonder anymore. We don't need to look at statistics to use as a proxy for this and take guesses. We'll have actual concrete data that uh, relates directly to war. Now, the Marine Corps did a, a mixed uh, unit versus an all-male unit. Um, and then you always get, you, well, you get some people say, oh, they didn't get the strongest females, they're running the women down. I want, the reason I want the women to have their own is because I don't want anybody to come back later and go, oh, or to be able to you know, reasonably argue, oh, the patriarchal males just kept screwing them over because they didn't want them in there. Uh, like, you know, uh, in the mixed unit thing, oh, uh, you know, if only this... Uh, this heterosexual white devil hadn't been here, I would have grabbed that ammo can and hoisted it up to the wherever it needs to go, but but no, he thought I couldn't handle it, and he came by and he took it from me, and that's why our time was you know, three-tenths of a second too low and we didn't qualify. If only he had trusted me, we would have pulled up. None of that. You sink or swim on your own. You fail or you prevail uh, based on the talents of the strongest women in the military. Transgenders, uh, you win or you fail based on your strengths and weaknesses. Gay guys, straight guys, everybody. So let the let the cards fall where they may. If it's good enough, uh, if it's a good enough principle on which to stake the future of a group of colonists who created the you know the conditions that set the, uh, the stage for the strongest country ever to ex uh, to rise that has ever existed, then I think it's fair enough for the citizens of that country to uh, be willing to uh, you know, put their money where their mouth is and engage in an actual contest and uh, have their metal tested. It seems to have worked quite well for us for the last uh, couple centuries. I think it will work spectacularly well here. And I'm sure that's absolutely, I'm absolutely sure that's why it won't happen. <laughs> but that is my idea. Have a great day.